So I'm Lucy Brown, I'm the Director of Leadership Development at the Florence Nightingale Foundation Academy, and it's my great uh, pleasure to host the webinar series. And we're really excited, we hear from leaders from across healthcare, uh, particularly across the UK, but obviously uh, beyond as well. And we're really pleased to welcome today Lisa Green, who's the Director of Clinical Home Care, and Daniel Campbell, the Director of Clinical Research and Oncology um, for Ben Healthcare, which is a really great startup, although I think you've been going for a few years, but actually gives us and showcases how nurses can be entrepreneurs and set up their own businesses and lead and um, blaze a trail, as I like to say, and be pioneers in healthcare. So they've got some really great lessons for us this afternoon on how to set up a business, but actually how to deliver excellent home health care, which is just fantastic. Um, just some housekeeping before we get started. We will be recording this afternoon. Um, so it will be available on our YouTube channel in a couple of days' time for you to access and share with your colleagues. So please do share far and wide. Um, and equally, we um, will also uh, be taking questions at the end for Daniel and Lisa. So please do feel free to put anything in the chat box, which I can ask on your behalf. Or if you're feeling brave, please do raise your hand and you can ask a question. Okay. So that's it from me. Um, without further ado, I'm going to hand across to Danielle and Lisa, and it gives me great, great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to present your webinar. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lucy. Um, so hopefully technology is going to be my friend now. I'm just going to start to share my screen and then we'll do some proper introductions to, to who we are and where we've come from and, and kick off for the next uh, few uh, minutes with everybody. So let me hope that technology lays. So hopefully that has worked. And if nobody shouts to tell me they can't see slides, I'm going to assume that it does. So thank you so much for having us. We're so grateful to Lucy and the team for, for allowing us to come and speak to everybody today and get, get to meet um, some like minded professionals across the world, which is really exciting. Um, so what we wanted to do was just have a chat with everybody today about what we do at REN Healthcare and how we got to this point and share some of the lessons that we've learned along the way and some of our experience and what as nurses, as innovative nurses, we've been able to do for patient care and what we can keep being at the, the forefront of throughout um, our journey with REN Healthcare, and what that looks like for our patients and also what that looks like for the nurses that, that work with us as part of our team as well. So just a little agenda for the points that we're going to go through. We'll do some introductions so you can get to know Lisa and myself. And then we're going to talk about what clinical home care is and what we do and a bit about REN Healthcare and our background and, and how we got to this point. Um, we're going to look at some of the, what the patients say about what we do and what we can deliver and what we've achieved over the past uh, few years with our, with our services what that looks like actually for the other partners that we work with. So what it looks like for the NHS and the doctors and the, the sites that we work with for the care that we provide. And then what it looks like for the nurses working in clinical home care with us and um, any questions we'll be more than happy to take at the end. If you do have any questions as we go through, please do just pop them in the chat box. Um, we might not answer them as we're speaking, but we'll definitely come to them at the end and be able to, to answer anything that you do have. So, um, I'll move us on to our introduction slides. It's always horrible talking when there's a picture of yourself on the screen, but um, I'll just start off and introduce myself a bit better and then hand over to Lisa. Um, so as Lucy kindly said, I'm our Director of Clinical Research and Oncology here at REN Healthcare, which sounds like a much more fancy title, I'm sure, than I deserve. But I'm a nurse first and foremost, and I um, qualified back in 2013 and very quickly found a passion for oncology in my career. I really enjoyed working in that patient group. It has been a very rewarding um, environment and sometimes an underserved patient population outside of uh, oncology specialist areas. So I was, a, I was one of those nurses that qualified in six months, decided what I was going to do, and I didn't really stop until somebody let me go and work in, the, in a chemotherapy unit and, and got me on a training course, uh, much to probably many of my uh, manager's annoyance but um, yes so I, I've worked in chemotherapy I'm a chemotherapy trained nurse that's my speciality I did that within the NHS um, for a year or so then I moved on in my uh, oncology journey and worked within bowel cancer screening so I tried to do that end-to-end -end patient journey to really see that see that journey through for patients to be able to offer some more holistic care I then went on and worked um, for a private home care organisation um, and I ran a team of chemotherapy nurses across the south of England. 
Um, so yeah, I stepped over to maybe the what might be seen as the dark side of healthcare uh, here in the UK. I stepped out of the NHS. After I moved to private healthcare, I then moved on to the maybe the even darker side, and I went and worked in the pharmaceutical industry for a little while as a nurse educator. I ran the oncology education for um, in, a, in a team for a global pharmaceutical company for our, our UK organisation um, around some oncology medications, which was a really fantastic role, and it's uh, it was interesting to be able to to come at it from a different angle as a nurse, uh, not be directly patient facing, but still being able to impact patient outcomes through education and educating a, a wider workforce. And then um, after being there for a while, I moved over and joined the team at REN Healthcare. So REN Healthcare, I'll talk more about us as an organization, was founded in 2018. I joined in early 2019 um, uh, as part of the, the sort of founding family here at REN. And uh, I'll uh, hang fire and I'll tell you more about us as an organization in a minute, but I'll, I'll hand over to Lisa and let her talk through her experience. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so hi, everybody. Really nice to meet you all. So uh, my name's Lisa. Um, as I've been introduced, I'm the Director of Clinical Home Care here at REN. Um, and just to give you a bit of background, like Danielle, um, I'm a nurse um, by background. I've been qualified, I'm pretty sure it's over 16 years now. I was just trying to work it out in my head. I can't remember, but it's, it's definitely around then, if not more. Um, and I started, from when I qualified, I worked in, in the NHS and on surgical wards mainly, um, Acute surgical wards was what I was interested in, and palliative care. Um, I then worked through, I did a bit of travelling, I worked in Australia for a while. And then when I came back, I worked in a couple of London hospitals, again on surgical wards, before moving into home care. Um, if I'm honest, my move from one of the London hospitals into home care at the time was just to have a bit of a break. I was working on a 63-bedded um, acute ward, and it, it was just really heavy, and I just needed a few months out, and then I was going to decide where I was going to go next. I hadn't really worked that part out. Um, and I joined a home care company as a home care nurse, um, which I suppose would be equivalent of a band five at the time. Um, and it was, I just loved it. I loved the, um, I loved having the one-to-one -one patient care. I liked that I could manage my own patient caseload. It was my first time working really in the community. I had had a district nurse placement at university, but it was, it was really different to that. Um, I had, I was given a company car. It was my first brand new car. And I thought that was absolutely amazing at the time as well. And yeah, I just, I love that I was managing my own case. I was seeing four or five patients a day um, and I built really strong relationships and, and kind of built relationships with the patients because you can see them often as well. I then worked, I worked within that home care company for about four years and I worked my way up through different roles. So um, came in clinically, then worked as a clinical manager, then as a regional manager. And then took on more of a national clinical lead role, particularly, again, it was around surgical patients. So it was parental nutrition for patients with IF. Um, so it was still using my background experience within the NHS um, and then developing services nationally for this home care company, which was great. And I really enjoyed. Then the opportunity came up with another home care company for a kind of more senior management role, which I did move over to after four years. And I worked in that company for about five years. And that was at a, I started as kind of a area manager and then became a business development manager. So I started stepping into more of the commercial side of home care. Again, still looking after um, patients on parental nutrition, immunology patients, patient support programs, um, and enteral patients. And working at a, um, it was a really large company. So I was responsible for the nursing service, but then also the, um, the customers and the accounts building those relationships. And then I moved from there over to REN. So having worked with um, Director Danielle and worked with my um, the directors previously in other roles, it seemed like a perfect fit. It was a um, it was a new company. It was a startup. They were just starting to um, dip their toe into clinical home care, which I'd just spent the last 10 years doing. So it seemed ideal for me. It was an opportunity to take on a director role. So um, I'd be responsible for the overall nursing service and all of the patient care and building those services from scratch, really right down from documentation processes, policies. So it, it felt like the absolute perfect fit. So I moved over to Wren, um sometime last year now so I've been here almost a year and it's been yeah it's been it's been going really really well well um, Danielle will present next on a bit about Ren and then I'll be giving you some updates around home care so I'll hand back over to Danielle. Thanks Lisa um yeah it probably feels like you've been here longer than a year I think it uh I think uh every every week in Ren healthcare uh days adds up to about six months I think uh with, with the amount of work that, that that goes in from our team um, so a little bit about us as an organisation. So I already said we were, we were founded in 2018 and 
we were founded by nurses and I was chatting away to Lucy earlier on and and Lucy sort of knows some of our journey and I think it's quite nice to talk about here today because there's not many organizations out there like us that are nurse-led and the REN was really born out of a bit of frustration um you know we're we're a clinically led company and we'd worked for different providers we'd done our time working in the NHS within the private sector pharmaceuticals and we really felt that there was there was a gap there's something that we could do and we could do maybe better or differently and really try and be pioneers of coming at um clinical home care from from a different perspective lots of other organizations are driven by doctors or they're driven by pharmacy or they're driven by industry but there's not really anybody else that is by nurses for nurses because i think at the end of the day if when it comes to patient care without nurses quite a lot of stuff doesn't happen so if you can have an organization that looks after its nurses you automatically look after your patients and one of our biggest messages is around patient-centered care and that's what we want to be experts in delivering in delivering and evidence-based care and i think that comes so well from nurses so um it, our managing director is a nurse and really Ren Healthcare is his is his baby and it was out of that frustration that Ren, that Ren was born and we really wanted to do something different and I think hopefully we are doing that and it's um there's not I suppose we're entrepreneurs it's hard to talk about uh I think as nurses it's really hard to talk about yourself and what you've done and be confident in that in that speech but actually we've been really innovative and in that innovative idea we've just absolutely driven behind it and hopefully made a success so the story of us was our, our cqc registration was granted within in 2018 and we were set up to be a specialist clinical home care provider so to provide high-tech uh, nursing solutions for patients at home and, and lisa will talk more about that in a minute and what that means for what we can do for our patients um and we did that and alongside that we also set up our clinical skills academy because we also saw a lot of the disparities in education that happened across the country when it came to, to clinical education. You could see a patient in um, Kent and be told to follow a particular hand hygiene policy, but then you could see a patient in Newcastle and be told to follow a completely different one. But surely there's only one way that we should be washing our hands, for example. So we also set up our Clinical Skills Academy to try and remove some of those disparities. Um, and that's where we started. And 2018 rolling into 2019 there was an interesting thing that happened across the world this pandemic that slightly uh, made us alter how we were operating so as a startup company hitting into a pandemic we were thrown a lot of challenges and there were some road bumps for us to get over over the way and it really made us be adaptable and flexible to the ever-changing and volatile environment um, and as nurses I think we're pretty good at doing that on a day-to-day -day basis and we tried really hard to channel that um that energy and that adaptability from our experience as nurses and having to change on a minute by minute basis into how we operated our business so we worked for a little while doing some uh diagnostics and covid testing which was a were a very busy time and a very ever-changing and we had to learn to work with different regulatory bodies as well as the cqc and running our, and growing our clinical home care services and our education services alongside that so it's been a really interesting time. And now we're obviously coming out of the pandemic and we're able to really focus our, our, our energies on that original um, setup of the organization to offer this expert clinical um, resource for patients at home and grow our nursing team and support more and more patients um, across the UK. But not only that, we're now offering from a clinical trial standpoint services across the world. So um, we've gone from being yeah a very very small organization within 2018 to, to growing our services quite rapidly across um the last few years to yeah maybe one day world domination uh might be there but uh that makes me sound like some sort of uh, e evil genius but um hopefully that gives you a bit of a whistle stop tour of the, of the journey of ren healthcare and and how we've got to where we are and we're really fortunate with the team that we've grown as well as lisa alluded to earlier we've worked the lots of the staff that we work with now we've worked with in previous lives and it's been sort of not been too challenging to get people to come on board and understand the message that we have and the values that we have here of Ren and 
innovation is one of those and being dynamic and practical and inclusive and i think we have a really wonderful team and and yeah we've we've all sort of supported each other throughout that journey i don't know if there's anything else that that you'd like me to add there lisa or you wanted to add in no no that's great thanks Tony. fantastic so i'll just do i've started to speak a little bit about some of our core business unit areas and how we operate and see our patients and support nurses across the country as well so um one of the one of the business areas is clinical trials and clinical research which is um where i come in and i support that business unit so we see patients at home that are actively um, undergoing clinical research activities and we support them in their home with those activities that might otherwise have been traditionally supported in site well, I'll talk more about those types of services and what, what that means for our patients. Um, then we operate in high-tech clinical home care and Lisa in the next slide is going to talk a bit more about what that means. Um, and then our clinical skills academy so that um, expert nurse educators across the country that provide clinical education both to other nurses, allied healthcare professionals, um, as well as even some administrative staff that are learning and growing their skills and being able to be um, offering more and more to patients. So that's how we operate. I will hand over to you now, Lisa, to talk through um, clinical home care. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so, yeah, so what is clinical home care? I guess um, some of you on the call may know and some of you may have no idea. We are part of a um, national clinical home care um, association and actually one of our one of our um, agenda or actions that we're always looking at and we've called we've actually given it a project is the, the nhs is best kept secret it, it, it's it's unbelievable to us because we've worked in home care so long that so many people don't know about it and that there's so many um nhs kind of consultants and teams specialist teams that haven't actually heard of home care and if they have heard of it they're not sure how to utilize it so um so that's the first thing. So if you do have any questions about home care at the end or during, do um, just pop them in the chat because we'll be more than happy to answer those. But basically, clinical home care, there's, well, there's nothing basic about it, first and foremost. Um, it, is a, it's, it is doing nursing, everything that you can do in the hospital, doing it in, in the home. Um, and there's different types of clinical home care. So Danielle mentioned around high tech. So there's low tech, mid tech and high tech. And basically what that means is just the nature of the visit, whether the visit is going to be kind of more basic where it's a subcut injection or whether the, the visit will be more complex where we'll actually be doing an IV infusion, whether we'll be using a cannula or whether we'll be using a, a central line or a port. So that's what those kind of tech levels mean. Um, we support patients, clinical home care support patients nationally all across the country to get patients out of hospital quicker. So anything that they can have in the home that they don't need to have in hospital, that's where clinical home care comes in. So the patients will be discharged from hospital and they'll have a home care provider come in like Ren to do either daily visits or twice a day visits or weekly visits, it really depends on what the therapy is, and purely treatment for drug administration. Um, and as I said, that can be through any, um, lots of different routes. We also do patient training as, a, as part of that. So it's really important for us that um, patients are given the opportunity to train so that they can have more independence with their with their therapy so what we don't want is patients kind of sat at home waiting around thinking that they need to wait for a nurse if they are able to do it themselves we will definitely try and encourage that and um, to help the patients kind of gain just that bit more control over their over their life and over their um their health so we we support them with training as well our nurses are all um, very experienced with home care we do have nurses that come um, directly from nhs into home care we usually like to encourage kind of a couple of years, at least two years qualified, um, just because it's important to kind of have that acute, acute experience in the first instance before stepping into home care. Obviously, the big difference between home care and um, hospital is that the nurses, we are administering treatment independently on our own in the home. So we kind of don't have that second checker. We have all the processes in place and prescriptions and everything to ensure it's safe, but it's very different to administering um, kind of when you're drawing up treatments in the in the clinic in the clinic room and then bring them out to a patient where you've got a colleague kind of checking in with you so that's the main things the patients we, we look after our range so we, we do look after pediatrics and adults and across all different services so as i said earlier patients that have parental nutrition so some type of intestinal failure we also do patient support programs that are patients that perhaps might have psoriasis or arthritis um, and we do immunology for immunology, do IVIG patients, subcut patients to administer their treatment in, at home. And I'll talk through some of those um, benefits, some of the benefits to the patient as well next. 
Thanks, thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Um, yeah, I always you just highlighted that key point there about where the difference between home care and being in the hospital. And I remember when I first started working in home care and the thought that I, uh, I'm a very conscientious practitioner and I always like to double check things. And the fact I can just take my head down the corridor and ask somebody, am I, can you just double check this for me? Uh, it was a, it was an interesting um, thing to get my head around and start to do, but knowing that you also have a team at the end of the phone all the time it's just getting used to communicating in a different way it's a yeah it's it's that's one of the the big differences I think yeah and that's it and then that's why all the nurses they'll have phones they'll have ipads laptops so communication is really really important so there you are there on your own as Danielle said there's always somebody on the end of the phone of course you still have that support it's just in that moment um it would it ne generally would just be you and the patient or the patient and their um carer or family member yeah um, I, I don't want to jump ahead in our slides, but there's lots of benefits to that as well. So I'll, I'll save that for later. <laughs> tease it out. Um, so just a note then about what we do for patients that are undergoing clinical trials and what that what that means. So we talk about decentralised clinical trial, which is a bit of a buzzword in, in the community at the moment. But what we're doing is we are basically, we're trying to make clinical research more um, inclusive. We're trying to get to a wider population of patients. So being able to carry out some of the activities for patients at home. For anybody that's worked in research, you know, you'll know that it can be very burdensome for patients having to go in for repeated visits, for repeated tests, for repeated questionnaires and things like that. And something that we noticed whilst we were on our journey through REN Healthcare is there was a real need for the services that we do in clinical home care for clinical trial patients. And I'll talk about some of the benefits and some of the stats and statistics around it that, that led us to this point. But again, it was all part of our being adaptable and flexible meeting the needs that, that aren't always being met by patients was noticing that these patients can really benefit from home visits so we um so we managed to remove some of the burden of uh traveling to hospitals patients that are undergoing clinical research often have got an illness anyway they've got a disease anyway that they're living with which is already potentially causing them burden so we try and remove some of that by visiting the patients at home and carrying out activities that might otherwise be done um, within the hospital and we do that by upskilling our nurses so we'll have some nurses that will come on board with us that are already uh, working within a research environment um, and then others will come in and they'll be experienced home care nurses but what we'll do is support them to do their um, GCP training so their good, good clinical practice training upskill them in things like using centrifuges in the patient's home um, and support them to, to get that additional skill so um, Again, I'm sort of jumping ahead to some of the benefits of working in the clinical home care environment, but that area of development can be really exciting. And uh, yeah, hopefully our nurses enjoy working across both of those, those business units and those different patients that we see. So I think we probably already have started to talk about some of the things that we do for our patients at home, but we'll um, just go through some of the bits and pieces on the screen here. So. We, I think a lot of the questions that I get asked when I'm speaking to people that are either coming to work in home care or uh, are trying to understand what we do is uh, how big is the boot in the nurse's car? Um, or if I'm speaking to my American colleagues in the trunk, um, because of the amount of stuff that we can do. So we can do basically anything that would happen in the hospital as long as we can fit it in the car and it's safe. So we can carry out adverse events monitoring diary reviews for patients particularly in clinical trials we can do patient assessments toxicity assessments um, ecgs vital signs reviewing of medication all of those things that would usually and often happen at hospital and then we have our sample collections so i just spoke about the fact that some of our nurses are trained in using centrifuges so particularly in clinical trials you often have to process samples in patients home so we'll carry out phlebotomy and then we'll upskill the nurses to use the centrifuges to carry a portable centrifuge, take it into the patient's home. We spin the blood and we extract the serum and plasma um, and get that ready to be shipped off in specialist sort of logistic ways, which is always uh, quite exciting. Patients get quite excited when it looks like you've turned their kitchen into a lab and they all want to start to have a look and see, see what wonderful things it is that you're doing. Um, and other sorts of sample collection, we can also perform you know, urinalysis, uh, sample collection, uh, capillary sampling and those bits and pieces. And then Lisa, do you want to just touch on the medications that we can administer? Yeah, now of course, um, so medications, I've touched on that on the last slide, but 
Again, as Daniel said, it's really anything um, that we can do in the home. So the hospitals refer to us or our accounts refer to us and on there they'll say what, what it is that they want us to administer to the patient. And what we would do is we'll um, arrange for the first delivery to go in and then we'll arrange for our first nurse visit. We'll often have a pre-call with the patient or pre-pandemic we would go into the hospital and meet with the patient and kind of introduce our services and really that the purpose of that call or meeting is just to make the patients aware sometimes they don't realize the amount of deliveries they get so the patients could have boxes boxes of equipment they'll have a fridge they'll have a, a box of um kind of ansil so gloves giving sets um wipes they'll have all the different hand washing and soaps and again we talked about standardization but depending on the protocol there'll be different ansils that the hospital may want the patient to have so it's really making them aware that they're going to get these, that their home, at least a portion of the home or an area will kind of become a, um, slightly clinical for them for a while while they're having this treatment and it gives them a bit of time to get their head around that. And then our nurses will go in and deliver that treatment. As I said, it could be IV infusions. We can do them through a pump. Um, we can do, uh, we do IM injections, we do subcut injections, and then we do our patient training for uh, self-administration as well. Thank you, Daniel. Cool. Oh. So obviously we can do lots of lots of different things, but Lisa, it'd be great if you could just talk through some of the benefits um, that our patients talk about when they're when they're having a treatment. Yes, yeah, so perfect. So for the next section, we're going to talk through some of the benefits to the patient and then also benefits to the NHS. So really the, the main benefits to the patients and what we do get patients kind of feedback, and there has been research done around this as well, but the main patient benefits is the control over their lives. So if you think about a patient who's kind of in hospital having a treatment, family members can't work, um, they're having to go into the hospitals and pay for parking, pay for childcare. So the, for patients having treatment at home, they can continue with their day-to-day -day life. We can work our visits around them. So we can visit them after they finish work or for some patients, we can do their treatment or training in their, in their work environment. We can visit them when they're on holiday. So if they move locations or they go on holiday for a couple of weeks, we can continue those visits in a different location rather than the patient having to either cancel their holiday or travel back and forth from the hospital centre. Um, as I said about parking, so patients, some of our patients are really unwell um, and they could be travelling three or four hours on a train to get to their referring centre. So we allow the, the opportunity that they won't have to do that travel. They can stay within their own home. They can stay with their families and then we can work around them. So again, it's patient choice. Um, I think Danielle said at the beginning, everything we do around REN and our philosophy of every step all of our documentation, even our interview documentation, is all based around individualised care and, in, and individualised treatment. So patient and um, patient individualised care is really, really important to us, part of that patient having a choice. So right from the beginning of their journey with REN, we build a patient care plan specific for them, not just for their um, for the medication we're going to be administering, but also for all the other areas that's really important to them. So for example, they can't do, they, they have something on on a Tuesday or they like to take their daughter to ballet on a Monday. All of those things are really, really important because actually our visits shouldn't interfere with their day-to-day -day life. That's the purpose of home care. We reduce hospital infections. Obviously patients are in hospital less, there's less chance of them picking up infections. There's also an improved compliance. So if you can think of yourself as a patient as well, if you're more um, involved in your care and the care is working more around your lifestyle, there's more chance that you're going to actually go along with it. And you're, you're going to take those injections. You're going to be in for your visit. You're going to receive that training that you really need because the, the service has been built around you as opposed to the service being built around the referrer or the company, which then leads to improved patient outcomes. And I guess the other big benefit for patients is we have an out of hours so at any point if the patients ring they can get through and speak to a nurse 24 7 and that's really important for the patients to know that they've just got somebody there in case they need them they may never use that number but it's just peace of mind for them to need it. they have somebody thanks danielle and then i think oh no so next i'll hand back over to danielle who's going to talk you through a couple of scenarios well thanks lisa yeah, so we're just obviously Lisa's spoken us through some of the benefits that our patients uh, that we think our patients get from having having uh, experienced clinical home care. But I like to I'm a bit of a storyteller. I like to tell a story. I like to give a bit of a case study and let you know what what our patients do say. And we've got some quotes in the next slide as well. But I think we're able to offer the patient those benefits because we come from that clinical background you know we're able to set up our services with our patients in mind and we listen to the nurses that that we have seeing our patients out there and we really want to establish 
that exact patient centricity that that is so important to us as, as a nurse-led organization so I'll maybe just talk through one scenario I'm, co I'm conscious of time I've got probably ton, tons and tons of tales that I could tell but there's a patient recently that that we've helped to support and they are actually they are a clinical trial patient and they have a rare disease and it's somebody that had had to have you know lifelong that is a lifelong disease that they, they'll live with and They've been through that from childhood through to the adolescence into, into young adulthood now. And the burden of that disease had become really heavy and there'd been constant trips to hospital and having to deal with car parking spaces and taking time out of school and then taking time out of work and taking time out of, of, of their usual day to day living um, and having to sit in the car for hours to get to the specialist centre because of their disease, having to find a car parking space, trapes across the car park. We then moved through a pandemic. All of that um, had taken quite a lot of um, quite a lot of burden for the patient. I know I keep saying that word burden, but it had removed some of the stability for them. They didn't know when they might be allowed to take a relative with them to appointments. They didn't know if, how long they were going to be sat waiting in a waiting room or who was going to be in the waiting room. Um, are they going to be surrounded by lots of other sick people or people that necessarily they might not have much in common with? And what we've managed to do is, is build a service for that patient that meant that we were seeing them at a time and a day that was important for them. So that stability and that extra choice and that empowerment was really, really key. And actually, it, it, this was a patient that potentially could have then stopped to look after their disease, that it was removing some of their autonomy, having to constantly go to hospital appointments and having you know, their, their disease taken out of their hands. We were able to go on days that were specific for them to support times that were specific to to be able to give the treatment at, at, at that point that was a focus for that patient we were able also to work with the rest of the family um and the dog our marketing team always laugh at me because i always want that picture of someone cuddling their dog and that might be because of my uh, puppy but i'm not going to talk about that but what it is is it's really including that whole family and you can't always do that if it's not in a in a home care environment. So we could go and carry out our activities for that patient in her home. She could then go off and play with the dog in the garden or go for a walk whilst we were finishing finishing things off. And that was really important for them, really giving them that control, choice, empowerment. I think it's, you know, we're obviously huge advocates for, for clinical home care, but just one case like that, it might feel like just one person, but for, but for them, that is 100% of their care at that one moment you are focused on that patient you're getting them exactly what they need they're reporting to you things that they may not uh, want to report elsewhere because they've built that rapport with you they see that you're not although you might be busy with the rest of your day as a as a home care nurse but at that moment in front of that patient you don't look busy you're you're doing it for them you're just there they can't see the other patients that, that are there for you so they're happy to report things they're not worried about taking up your time I think it's um it's really important and yeah, we're ongoing treat, treating patients in that way. And uh, that's just one of many scenarios, I think, that match that. Um, I'll move on to the quotes now, which Lisa's going to kindly take us through, but I'm sure Lisa will also have to, some examples for us. Uh, thanks, Danielle. So um, you can see just some of our patient quotes um, up on the screen. I won't read through them, but what we do as a home care provider, it's really important for us that we're gathering feedback. Um, in, in lot, for lots of reasons, it's important, but mainly really to help our um, service improvement. We want to know if there's any areas we can we can improve, make changes. We are a fairly new young company and we are building all the time and we want to make sure our focus is absolutely to keep the patient at the centre. So we need that feedback to make sure that that's what we're hearing back. And actually, it's lovely because this feedback was exactly that. I mean, some of the words used across here, um, we kind of see a trend throughout our feedback. And it's the basic stuff, the kind of feedback we receive that the patients love is just that the nurse listens. So like what Danielle was just saying, they listen, they were kind and kindness is one of our own company values for that reason um, and that they and that they showed that they care and they just gave them that time and that's what we build into all of our kind of nurse training it's great we can kind of teach and train all the kind of technical bits for all of the work we do but actually the basics the fundamentals need to be there across our nursing team and we feel reassured when we get feedback like this that it is and um, we make sure that we get we gain patient feedback following all of our visits that all the patients get asked and it's all sent in obviously confidentially 
and we do share it with the nursing team because it's great isn't it it's really important for the nurses to know that that they are valued and that every visit that they do is never like Danielle said it's never just a visit for that patient it means so so much more so when they receive feedback like this I think it just reinstills actually why that is so important and gives them makes them feel valued and a lot happier in their roles as well because they feel like they're making a difference which they are they are every single visit that they do yeah that's it thank you Daniel did you want to add anything around that one I don't think so no I think it's um yeah I think we could half on about it all the time I think yeah. feedback's key um I think getting that patient feedback is really important I think also again just to harp on about us being a nurse provider but I think and as a a newer organization or a younger organization the other feedback that's really important to us is our nurses out on the road as well and being able to understand from them what is it actually that our patients need what can we do to improve that experience and trying to be as a uh, quick at making those changes once we understand them um, as possible um yeah i think that's just the only other thing that i'd add but let, let's Thank talk about you. what it means to to the nhs lisa so yeah so we've talked a lot about obviously the benefits to the to the patient but we also will touch on the benefits to the NHS. Obviously, there needs to be benefits. There needs to be benefits for the NHS, for the NHS to use home care. And if we're honest, if we, we all know, we know the situation that's been over the last few years with COVID. And NHS is in more pressure now than it has been for over 70 years. So now more than ever, there is a need for home care, um, really, to have that input. We can support in so many different ways. We've talked around the um, fact that home care helps with patient um, adherence to treatment what comes with that is less admissions what comes with that is then you've got more beds that are free for the patients that actually really really do need it and that need to be in hospital for their treatment i've put up some um, statistics that you'll see there from the bma and that's from february and that just shows really the situation at the moment with the amount of patients that are waiting for treatment number of patients waiting to get into a and e everything as you'd expect is just well, you can see the A&E uh, times there for over 12 hours is 20 times higher than it was pre-pandemic. And that's kind of a trend across all services. So there's definitely a need right now for us to, to think outside the box, for us to do something different and to make sure that we're, um, for a home care point of view, we're raising the profile. So I said about um, home care can be NHS best kept secret. But it really is raising the profile and making us easy to work with so that um, hospitals know how exactly how to, they can get a patient from that hospital bed to home with a home care service and it isn't complicated that process for them as a referrer so we really really try again we've talked about um, patient-centered care we also have account-centered care to make sure that we are easy to work with because ultimately if we can work really well and build good partnerships with the nhs against the patient will um it's the patient will see the advantages to that because we can get patients out of hospital quicker at home and then trained as well as independent so it's it's an ideal situation Thank you, Danielle. I'll hand over, I think, to you for the clinical trials. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, so just some similar sort of statistics to run through around what, um, what is happening in the cl clinical trial space and the clinical research space. So um, when it comes to clinical trials and participation, there is a huge dropout rate um, in clinical trials for patients, um, around 30%. And, you know, there's lot, a number of different reasons that that might happen, but all but if we can make things more accessible and easier to access for patients, then they're more likely to stay on board. I've spoken a lot about, and I've used the word burden quite a lot, but it's trying to take that burden away from the patient and making things patient centric. And I think a lot of the time in clinical trials, the historically it's been trial centric, sponsor centric and site centric rather than patient centric. So being able to decentralize solutions is really key for supporting patients and their ability to be able to maintain their their rigorous schedules. Um, that means that um, also from a recruitment perspective, um, here we've got 80% of trials fail to enrol on time. And if that's not because patients are getting a good enough choice about how they're able to participate in research potentially. Also what we find and, and a huge driver for me at the moment um, is around inclusivity and access. If you are only able to involve patients in research that are only able to get to a trial site, then you're excluding a population already. You are not able to make inclusive um, research, which is reflective of a true population. Decentralizing solutions and being able to see patients in their own environment and make things more accessible to them can only make waves to make things more inclusive. 
I don't think this is the only solution to that issue. I think there's lots of things at grassroots that potentially need to change, but it can only go to improve things as much as as much as we can do. And it's a real driver for me uh, at the minute. Um, and then if we look about the pandemic, I, you know, I said about it being a challenge for us as an organisation, but it's been a challenge for everyone and it's been a challenge for the NHS. And you've just seen those statistics there, but also because of clinical trials. Um, you know, about 80% of clinical trials were stopped during the pandemic. And that's research that was essential for patients and the, the future of, of medicines and treatments. So being able to be ready to have solutions like seeing patients at home um, as a weapon in, in your arsenal at all times is, is key. So we're trying really hard, again, as, as clinicians to share the message and educate out there around research and the fact that things can happen um, in a decentralized way. We can do it at home. It doesn't have to be challenging. It doesn't have to be hard. We can have those relationships with our, with our, um, with our partners. And something that we found throughout the journey of working within decentralized trials and actually within our clinical home care as well is again I'm harping on about us being nurse led but we're that's what we're that's what we are and that's what's important to us but we can speak the right language we can encourage our clinicians and, and the people that are referring patients to us to be confident in the care that we're delivering we understand patients um, we really really do and if we can get our patients to trust us we can get our doctors to trust us we can get the nurses that we're partnering with in the nhs to trust us and that's only got to be positive for our patients and make that more accessible so that is the benefits um to to the people that we work with but what is it actually like to work in home care lisa do you want to uh uh, yeah, thanks, Daniel. We'll probably both jump in a bit with this, won't we? Given we've both um, worked within the nurse roles as well. Um, I think I said at the beginning, didn't I, that when I joined as a as a home care nurse, some these are the things I loved, and it hasn't really changed. Um, it's a varied field based role, so it's very different to a district nursing role. Patients can come out with different. Um, well, you've you've heard all about trials. You've heard about home care. So your day can involve seeing a variety of different patients on different therapies. Some patients who are having the more high techs so or the infusions that need daily treatment, um, and then you'll have more kind of independent patients that may be having a um, an injection or a patient support program once a month, and you're supporting them with training. Um, it's very flexible, so. Um, you do to a degree get to manage your own workload because you're you build up your own patient base um generally in your area but um obviously we are a, a national company national sorry nursing coverage so we support our colleagues as well so your patients may be um may be slightly spread out but obviously we d we don't want nurses to be spending hours in the car that's not efficient and it's not why nurses become nurses so we really do want to keep kind of patients together where we can um obviously i've said about it being on the road we do um home care companies provide cars we provide car allowances and it's being out on the road in the day actually you're we as i said it's different to a district nurse where your kind of hub is the doctor surgery ours is our home so you a normal an average day for a nurse would be to get up check your laptop your ipad there might be some visit changes and you'd get on the road visit your first patient patients generally have about a two-hour visit window so it allows time for you to get there so it allows for kind of traffic or any kind of car issues or things that can kind of prop up during the day um, and then you'll go on to your next patient. Some, some nurses will pop home then for lunch, then go back out again. It really depends how that day is. Every day is very different. It is autonomous. If you are out on your own, you have your phone, um, iPad. There's a level of, there's definitely the autonomy to make your own decisions because you're out in the field. You have your named kind of patients. You're responsible for their care. Um, and yeah, we've put there no day ever is the same. And, and that is exactly, that is home care. It's a kind of good summary of home care. Every day is very, very different. And every environment you go into is different as well, actually. Every house, you you kind of, well, you can kind of imagine not everybody lives the same and it's patient-centered care. So we build the treatment around the patient and not every environment you go into is the same. And that's, that's fine. That's okay. The only things we really absolutely need as a nurse to do the treatment in the home is running water and electricity. Providing we have two, those two things, we can make most things work. Um, and we have professional development. So I talked through my journey within home care. So did Danielle, you can probably see the different steps I moved through within 
my direction was management and um, we have nurses that join us that want to become um, trainers then we put them on a bit of a training pathway I've also had nurses in home care that have joined and they really really want to work within the sales team and that's that's good and um, we'll encourage that working across all areas of the business is really really good for nurses to build just to build that experience really so what we would do is we build pathways into those different roles doing your shoes days things like that to just build up the confidence um, and build up the experience working in those roles and more commercial roles and then we also support with training so training programs obviously we're part of Florence Nightingale which is amazing and we'll also support um, if there is any anything really that nurses or home care nurses are interested in or want to develop they would just have that conversation with us and then we would build that into their um, kind of one two three year plan within the company as well so it's huge huge opportunities for development and um, within clinical home care which which is great but again it's something we probably need to raise the profile of we're aware within NHS there's definite pathways um, and there, there's massive ones in home care too it's just I don't think it's as visible as it could be so we need to get better at that and that's definitely um, something that we're looking at doing for the future as well. And then Danielle, I don't know if you wanted to add anything there. No, know. just to, no, just to sort of reiterate the same message. I think you know it's it's obviously we're we're advocates for for what home care is and uh, and and how that goes. And I wanted to say something about being out and about and seeing the day go by is always <laughs> wonderful as a home care nurse and not something you always do to be to be shut indoors. But I think it's that variability and no day ever being the same that has probably led us to have the skills and that resilience to be able to found this organisation and go from there. You know. We talk about no day ever being the same. You can go from seeing a patient that might be uh, at work in a funeral parlour, then you've had to visit there and then adapt your skills and go and visit a patient that might be part of a circus. Uh, and I say that as two ends of the spectrum, but two real things. And I think that definitely has probably led us to the skills to get us to where, where we are today. And that ends our slides. Um, so it'd be great if there's any questions, if we've got time, I think we've probably overrun just a little bit. But um, yeah, mm -hmm. it'll be great to hear back from you, Lucy. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you. It'd be great to see the um, audience where I've got a few more people who have joined us. So please do pop your cameras on. It'd be really lovely to hear from you all. I've just got, I was writing some notes in the background. And as you know, Danielle and Lisa used to work with the home care. I think we've our paths have crossed, haven't they, many times. And it's something that I think I was blown away by being an ICU nurse by background, is it was so used to pressing the crash buzzer and everyone comes running and then suddenly it's, there is no one, it's just me. So you have to work autonomously and be resilient and quick thinking and problem solving. So it's a real strength and, and well done to all of you. What I really liked, um, wanted to touch on the fact that you've actually set up a, a company which nurses don't usually do. It's quite, it's quite um, extraordinary, quite amazing what you've achieved in such a short space of time. And I really liked what you said, it's about having a, a group of like-minded nurses together and, I think what you've demonstrated is you're agile and you've been innovative, kind of moving, putting the patient at the heart of everything you've done. And that's the thing why you've done so well, what I've taken away from today anyway, certainly from your presentation. And what's really nice is it feeds into this integrated care boards, doesn't it, that are now in place across the country. So working, working together across systems to make sure that we have a holistic approach to patient care and we're utilising all of our resources really impactfully and using specialised service to give the patient the best we can and give them a better quality of life and better health outcomes. So thank you. They were my key takeaways there anyway. But across to the group, to the team, so you can see that Lou and Claire have got their cameras on, so I didn't know if they had any questions. Or if you don't feel brave enough, that's okay. Please do pop something in the chat and I can ask it on your behalf. Um, I, I do have ready some questions. Go. Yeah, if, if that's okay. Thank you so much, Danielle and Lisa. That was a um, brilliant presentation and uh, so nurse-led and nurse-focused, which is lovely to see. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm Claire Marsh and I work at the Wessex Cancer Alliance. And I'm actually the SACT Closer to Home project manager. We've been running our project for 12 months now, and uh, we have another six months, possibly it might be extended. So we are working or um, sort of, we recently ran a stakeholder event to introduce pharma companies and home care companies to all of our six trusts to look at home care and the different options available to the NHS. Um, I think the pandemic has put real pressure on our cancer services. Our um, lots of our chemotherapy units moved from the NHS into private sectors for the first sort of year, 18 months of the pandemic. Most they're all now back in their own homes, which is great. But I just wonder a little bit more about your the SACT um, home care service that you provide 
and whether I've got lots of questions so it might be that there are too many and we have to meet up after this but really about your sacked nurse education are all of your home care nurses um, provide the education for sacked administration oh you just broke up I don't know if it was just me but the end of your question then Claire sorry you said it are your, sorry, your it was, nurses I was just, I think. Oh, sorry. Go on, go on Claire. Sorry yeah, again. are they are they all trained? Are all your nurses trained to give sacked? So not all of our nurses are, but the nurses that we would have out seeing our oncology patients, we would ensure that were were sacked trained and um, also would have had additional competencies signed off ahead of seeing any patients um, out in the community as well. OK, do they complete the Yukon sacked passport with um, an affiliation to a university, maybe Guy's Academy or something? Um, so in the most part, they would do um, work within that team. However, there's some nurses that have sort of predated that um, the sacked passport. So we would obviously make sure that they had reputable experience and accreditation from a chemotherapy course that, that were, were similar pre, pre that. OK. That's fine. Um, I would make an offer that if you do have any nurses who do require some SACT training in the Wessex Cancer Alliance, we do run our SACT training. And if they would like to access that, we're more than we're more than happy to support that um, if they're from Wessex, because we feel that the nurses looking after our patients in Wessex, we would we would like to support them. So maybe we can connect afterwards. Sorry, um, I'm not sure if anyone's got any other questions, but I have another question, if I may. <laughs> you you talked about your nurses having um, iPads and iPhone and things for connection. But how do you get around with SACT, how you actually um, document the administration of that? Do you link out to local hospital e-prescribing systems for SACT or is it do all done on a paper trail? Um, so it would depend on the projects that we work on so and who we were partnering with and if we could engage with their platforms or whether or not we need to do something with a platform that we have internally to try and feed into that. So it's a bit of a wishy-washy answer of not really answering it, but it, it depends on who we're, we're working with and what platforms are there. So we try to say we try and be as flexible and agile as possible. So we try and fit in with our patients and whoever we're partnering with needs rather than trying to make people fit into our box if that makes sense okay that's great and one more question if i may just about your um the compounding of the sact is that something that you as a home care company provide yourself or do you use a, a third party or are you expecting your hospitals to still compound the drugs yeah so that's a really good question um oh, lisa were you going to answer that i feel like oh, i'm no. talking <laughs> no, okay i was just going to say we do we do a variety so we don't as a company we don't uh, compound and dispense but we do partner we partner with other um larger companies that do that um and we've got good partnerships or if their hospital wants to dispense and compound that themselves then we would work with them so again it's just really what what the request is and what makes it easier for the hospital for us to work with us that's brilliant. Brilliant. If I put my email address in the chat, maybe we could um, organise a meeting after this and then I'll let somebody else ask lots of questions now. Thank you so much Claire, for your time. That'd be Claire, great. Thank, thank you so you. much. And isn't it amazing, the power of a network and, and connection? It's great. Great to see. Great to see. Um, any other questions for anybody else? Lou, Lou, no, didn't say any questions. I've got a question for you, actually. So to, oh, Lou, I think Lou, did you want to ask a question? Sorry, I double clicked and managed to uh, block my camera. I thought I saw you click, um, so I thought you might apologies. be coming back. <laughs> um, as you Claire answered a lot of them, but my um, my background is palliative care, so I'm palliative care um, clinical lead for Sue Ryder in the Gloucestershire area, um, and obviously the vast majority of our patients are through their uh, their active treatment, but but have palliative treatments, and is that something that could possibly be offered? With Ren at home, is that something, or is, do you just look at the treatments who are in, the patients are going undergo an active treatment? Uh, no, so do you mean, um, Lou, for, for palliative care, do you mean like syringe drivers and, and if, No, and no, I'm uh, meaning sort of palliative chemos and things like that. So um, they're still having a treatment as such to, to prolong their life, but not to extend. Yeah, if that yeah. Makes sense. So, yeah, do so yeah. your home, home chemos and things like that for palliative patients. 
Yeah, definitely we would. And in, in previous roles of work where we've given parental nutrition, we, it's the same. We would do that for palliative patients. It's definitely something we could support. It's not something we've been asked to just yet. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously it's been on the tenders and the contracts to allow for us to do those services. One of the, I suppose, not obstacles but one challenge we do find is, is access so there's lots of our nurses our nurses as we've said are high tech so our nurses are skilled to do all these things but it's kind of getting into the um it's accessing the services for us to be able to deliver that treatment so we've yeah. got nurses we've got the skills we've got the capacity but often um it's how people can work with us and how we can get onto the um contracts and access the right people to allow them to refer into us so that's that's kind of a bigger piece of work of what we're looking at but for technically um and operationally and for capacity we we, do, we definitely do that that might be something we could have a chat about then actually maybe at a later date but yeah definitely definitely and and i i heard you say you cover the whole of the country do you Yes, we're um, we're a national provider. We are Scotland is our place at the moment. We're in the process of registering with, so we're not currently um, registered to nurse in Scotland, but we're just going through all the um, due diligence and documentation currently. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks very much. No worries. Thank you. So I think that kind of brings us to the end of today. So this afternoon, thank you so much uh, for joining us. I think my key takeaway from from you at Ren Healthcare is you can if you insp you've inspired. I've certainly inspired me today. But actually, if you have aspirations to provide really great home care or you want, you want to make a difference to the services you provide, you can go out and do it. So if you innovate and work together, I really like what the term said about working with like-minded nurses to really make sure you put the patient at the heart of everything you do. And I think there's a lot of lessons for all of us there, isn't it, about how we can, you know, putting the patient first, we can really make a difference. So thank you all. Thanks for your time. This has been recorded. If you wanted to share it uh, beyond today, we'll pop it on our YouTube channel in a couple of days' time. Um, thank you all for joining us. I hope you had um, a great lunch break with us and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Lucy.